They've been doing a great job celebrating a ton of their legends this season. The latest to be honored, George Raveling. He was the first African-American coach in conference history. Well done by Pat Chun and Washington State Athletics to pay tribute to one of their own during Black History Month. And here's a look at some of the accomplishments for Raveling in his career. A couple NCAA tournament appearances with the Cougs, three-time conference coach of the year. Remarkable story Raveling actually told us here at Pac-12 Network just a couple days ago. Well, I think the first thing we have to kind of put it in this historic context. I, I was uh, uh, hadn't been out of uh, uh, too far away from graduation at Villanova, and and I ended up uh, going down to the March on Washington at the suggestion of my best friend's dad was a very prominent black. Uh, uh, doctor in Wilmington, Delaware, and we were down there on a Thursday night having dinner at uh, his name, my friend's name was Warren Wilson. And during dinner, the TV was on in the background, and they were talking about the March on Washington, which was going to be the biggest gathering of black people in one a place in the history of the United States. And he said to us, Dr. Wilson said, Are you guys going? And, 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 and we said, No. And he said, Why? And so we said, well, we don't have the money or a way to get down there. So he said, okay, I'll settle that. I'll give you guys the money, and you take one of the cars. Because for some reason, he had an idea that this was going to be a significant event. And so uh, we drove down th th that Friday night and tried to find a motel room. And then while we were uh, out, uh, moving around the city, we decided to go down to the Washington Monument grounds just to see what it looked like down there. And when we were walking around, a, a, a gentleman came up to us and he said, are you guys coming tomorrow? And we said, yes, and Warren 64 and I'm 64. So he looks at us and he says, uh, would you guys want to volunteer? And we said, for what? He said, to be security guards. And he wouldn't need twice as many. So we said, sure, we'll do it. So he told us to be down there the next, the next morning at 8.30. And we got there about 7.45 and we found him. He said, wow, you guys are early. And he looks at us again. He said, you're going to be assigned to the podium because we're going to have to have double security up there. So we were up and uh, served at, with about 15 other people as security guards around the, uh, the podium. And so there were speakers all day long but Dr. King was the last speaker and so we had a little uh, a strategic plan if something happened how to get him off the stage so they had told us when he gets down to the last paragraph they wanted us to start to close close in the, the V around them because we we're going to take him out the back of the Lincoln Monument and just as he was finishing he started to fold the speech and I said to him I said Dr. King can I have that speech and, and actually, they've done some documentaries on it, so they, they, they have that part on film. So as he's, he's folding it to hand, and hand it to me, the rabbi on the other end who's doing the benediction says, Dr. King, that's the greatest speech I ever heard. And so his attention shifted to, to the rabbi, and that was it. And so I now had the speech folded. But, but remember, no one knew then uh, that it was going to take on the historic context that it did. Uh, Malcolm X, in one of his speeches, used to say, history is best situated to reward all man's deeds. And so my interpretation of that is history will ultimately put things in their rightful perspective. So it took 50 years for, for that uh, speech to take on the historic significance that it, it, it has.